well. Um, but so to our audience, hi everyone. My name is Luckett Robinson and I am serving as this year's homecoming chair. And it's my honor to welcome all of you to Student Foundation's SMU Throughout the Ages homecoming lecture. So for those of you who don't know, we are celebrating our centennial homecoming here on the hilltop. 2020 marks 100 years of this time-honored and beloved tradition. To commemorate this milestone, we wanted to hear from some of our most prestigious and successful alumni about how SMU changed them and about how they changed SMU. Homecoming activity coordinator Piper Holden will serve as our moderator, and she'll be asking panelists about their careers, their SMU experiences, and their perspective on the growth our university has experienced. During tonight's lecture, we invite you to use the Zoom webinar's Q&A function to submit questions to panelists. Before we begin, I'd like to also extend a big thank you to Student Foundation President Sophie Pasternak, Vice President of Programming Mira Suesa, Advisor Lauren Chapman, and SMU Development for helping the Homecoming Committee facilitate this event. With that, I'm excited to introduce our SMU Throughout the Ages panelists. First, I'm so excited to introduce SMU alumnus Brian Baumgartner from the class of 95, most recognizable from his portrayal of Kevin Malone from the hit NBC series, The Office. Brian kept busy on campus with projects in theater development and after graduating from SMU, went on to help found the Hidden Theater in Minneapolis with fellow SMU graduates. He served as artistic director before leaving for Los Angeles and landing his hit role on The Office. Brian currently resides in Southern California, where he remains one of Hollywood's top ranked golfers. Thank you for being here, Mr. Baumgartner. Thank you. I don't know about prestigious Luckett, but I am awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, next, we have uh, Ambassador Karen Hughes, worldwide vice chair of global communications firm Burson, Cohn & Wolf. Karen graduated from SMU in 1977 with two degrees, a Bachelor of Arts in English and a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Journalism. She was a Phi Beta Kappa and a member of Alpha Delta Pi sorority. Today, Karen is a leading communication strategist specializing in crisis communications, executive communications, and strategic messaging. Her clients range from global corporations to Fortune 500 leaders to universities. Karen has more than 40 years of public policy, communications, and political experience, from helping lead winning presidential campaigns to serving at the highest levels of government. Karen served as counselor to the president for President George W. Bush from 2001 to 2002. In this role, she acted as strategic advisor to the president on policy and communications and led the White House offices of communications, media affairs, speech writing, and press secretary. Karen also served as Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, where she led the US government's efforts to communicate America's values abroad. She is a past executive director of the Republican Party of Texas and a former television news reporter for the NBC affiliate in Dallas, Fort Worth. Karen is the best-selling author of 10 Minutes from Normal, a book about working for President Bush and her decision to leave the White House to return with her family to Texas. Thank you for being here, Ambassador Hughes. So when you look at when you said that 40 years, it makes me realize I must be the representative of the SMU through the ages. <laughs> I need to take that line out of there. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. We're happy to have you. Um, so next we have Mr. Mark B. Patrick, class of 93. So Mark earned a Bachelor of Arts in Advertising from the Meadows School at SMU in 1993, where he was also a member of the men's track and field team. His career includes a 20-year tenure at Nike Incorporated, where he worked across numerous global business units and marketing functions, and ultimately led the corporation's global brand communications team and launched several groundbreaking Just Do It campaigns. Mark currently serves as the Senior Vice President of Marketing at Beyond Meat Incorporated and views his role as an opportunity to make a lasting impact on human health, climate change, global resource sustainability, and animal welfare. Mark is an executive board member for our very own Meadows School of the Arts and has been an active member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated ever since his days as a student at SMU. He and his wife, Angela, a fellow SMU graduate from the class of 93, have three daughters, one of whom is a sophomore majoring in business and film at SMU. Thank you for being here, Mr. Patrick. Great to be here. Shout out to Jazzy. I know she's watching. Hi, Jazzy. <laughs> And last, we have Ms. Tier Suzuki. Tier earned her Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering with Biomedical Engineering Specialization from SMU in 1996. 
With over 20 years of experience building high performing teams in the consulting profession, Kier Suzuki has a passion for developing purpose driven and courageous leaders to tackle our world's biggest problems. As Ernest Young's America's consulting talent leader, Suzuki creates a work environment for 21,000 professionals to grow their careers and build a better working world. Tier's previous roles have included advisory managing partner for the Southwest region and client service roles focused on large and complex technology programs. Tier is active with nonprofit organizations that develop leaders and lift up those who need a voice. With the Texas Women's Foundation, Tier served six years on the board of directors, two years as co-chair of the Economic Leadership Council and a proud founding member of the Orchid Giving Circle. Tier serves on the SMU Lyle Engineering School Executive Board the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum Board, the Boy Scouts of America National Executive Board, the National Asian Pacific Islander Chamber of Commerce and Entrepreneurship Board, and she co-chairs the 2020 Women on Boards National Conversation on Board Diversity Dallas Initiative. Tier is passionate about building leadership and philanthropic capacity in, in others to improve lives. And she lives in Plano with her husband, Eric, and their four sons. Thank you for being here, Ms. Suzuki. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Piper for our first question. Hello, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you so much to all of the SMU students, faculty, and alumni attending the lecture, whether on Zoom, our Facebook Live, or if you're watching this later on the SMU website. Additionally, I just wanted to extend another monumental thank you to all of our panelists who have taken the time out of their day to speak on their SMU experience and share some wisdom with us all. With that being said, I'm going to start our trip down memory lane by asking, what were you involved in at SMU and what is one of your favorite memories from your time with that organization? Who would like to start? <laughs> Dive in. I'll, I'll go for it. Uh, why not? Um, first of all, again, thanks for uh, hosting us and ha having such a great, uh, great group here. I can't wait to see you on the golf course, Brian. Uh, uh, so great question. I think I, you know, I was a part of a number of, of, of different things, you know, you know, it's, this is really fun to go down memory lane and think about it. You know, I think, um, I, I could put it into a few different buckets. You know, I was part, I was an athlete, as you mentioned, I was a student athlete. So there was definitely, you know, that, that community of athletes, you know, student athletes who, who all kind of did things together and bonded together. Um, I was uh, a part of, uh, uh, and still am a part of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. You know the oldest uh, collegiate black uh, Greek organization, and so we had a, ch a chapter there at SMU that I was so proud to to join there and be a, become a part of. And you know, and then I think you know also just being a part of uh, the Association of Black Students. Um, you know, that became my family. You know, so much so that you know, I mean, I have lifelong friends. You know, from that. You know, and we would get together often and do things as a community. And so all of those communities really merged together. And I think even lastly, you know, just part of. Uh, the advertising community, you know, I, again, be, I, from the beginning and now have life, lifelong friends, you know, uh, who are in the industry. And so all of those different communities merged together. I had an amazing time. You know, I guess a big memory is just, you know, in the fraternity, you know, we were the first uh, Black Greek organization to get a house on the campus, which was a really, really big deal. You know, things evolved from that point on. But you know, we had to had to build a whole campaign around it and, and make that happen and get the funding. And so, you know, we, we were learning and we didn't even know it. We just wanted a house, you know, and so we got one. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget that um, that experience uh, there. And I mean, there's so many memories. And so this is this is just uh, just the beginning of going down memory lane. Yeah, well, uh, again, Piper, thank you. Thank you all uh, for having us. I don't know if, if some of you students know I was supposed to be there in March. Uh, and I was going to be there a week and teach some classes and do some stuff. And of course, that was like March 26th when the world stopped. Um, so I look forward to getting back uh, soon. I, I guess how I tell people who, who, who didn't go to SMU, uh, I guess probably a lot of students and, and other parents, and, et cetera, don't know. You know, I chose to go to SMU because I believed at the time, and I, I still believe it now, that it was the best conservatory training program for theater in the country that was within a large university. So uh, I had decided at a fairly early age what I wanted to do. I wanted to become an actor. And the other thing I knew was that I didn't wanna go 
to say a, a Juilliard, if you've heard of that, or a Carnegie Mellon, a school that was so just singularly focused because I believed even at a young age that the more well-rounded my experience could be, the better for me ultimately as an artist. And, and let's face it, I wanted to have a little fun too. So I, uh, I chose SMU and, and my experience there, how I described to other people, it was much like you would uh, at least think of a, a football player or a basketball player or someone you know, in, a, in a huge scholarship sport. You know, we did, you know, we had to do lighting and we had to learn makeup and costumes and, you know, we were, had rehearsals all the time. So we were very stuck within Meadows. But, you know, what I'm tremendously thankful to the university for was to be able to give me experiences outside of that as well. That I think ultimately that well-rounded experience that, that I certainly found at SMU allowed me to singularly uh, pursue what I was, you know, very interested and focused on, but also give me a real college experience and a, and a breadth of, uh, of experience outside of Meadows. So it was like I lived in Meadows, but I also was able to at least visit other places uh, and have those experiences. So I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to the university for that. Karen, would you like to go next or? Go okay. Uh, so it's great to be here with everybody. Piper, thank you again and Luckett and the entire Student Foundation team. It's great that you all have worked so hard to put together this program. So thank you for having me here. So I made my way to SMU, gosh, I guess over 28 years now, it's hard to believe. And you all are younger than that and you weren't even born yet. So it's hard to believe that, that so much time has flown by. So I was a commuter student and I found my way to SMU through my third grade teacher who was a, an alum at SMU. And because of a scholarship nomination, uh, that was what kind of turned my attention to applying at SMU. It was the only school that I applied to. And thank goodness I was accepted because I didn't know that I uh, would have another option if I wasn't. Um, but when I was um, there, I majored in electrical engineering and I was very involved in student activities. So I, you know, I called my one of my advisors today that, to help him, to ask him to help me remember what did I do at SMU? And his response was, what did you not do? <laughs> so, there, I was involved with Program Council, the Honor Council, the East Asian Student Association, the Asian Council, um, the Student Senate, um, Student Foundation. I worked in the chaplain's office. I was also um, involved with the Women's Symposium. So I was actually one of the co-chairs during one of the, the years for a Women's Symposium. And I was involved with the ICE program. I don't know if the ICE program is still at SMU, but ICE stands for Inner Community Experience. And I had the opportunity one summer as a student to live in a habitat um, for humanity house um, in, in the inner cities in Dallas and had the opportunity to set up a computer lab you know, through the donations from the university and help work with uh, kids in, you know, in the community to learn um, computer skills as well as um, you know, just spend time with them and be there to, to help mentor them servicing the community. And so that, I would say that would, was my favorite memory in terms of the experience of living outside of my home. Remember I was a commuter, right? From my house to SMU every day and then having the opportunity to live in a home that was different from mine uh, and having the opportunity to work with, with the kids uh, was, really, was really a great experience. Thank you there. I love hearing all these other stories. Piper, thanks so much for having us and luck at it all of you at the Student Foundation. It's fun to, fun to do this. I, I don't think I've had an opportunity to talk about my SMU experiences for a number of years. Um, I think what stands out, I, unlike Brian, I did not know what I wanted to do when I went to college. Um, so I really didn't know what I was looking for. I knew I loved to read and write. And so my mom always, and I like to argue and ask questions. So my mom always thought I was going to become a, a lawyer. Um, instead, I kind of became a different kind of advocate in, in communications and in politics. Um, but when I went to SMU, SMU offered an SMU uh, three-year degree program at the time. And I thought, well, if I'm gonna go to law school, uh, it'd be nice to get my undergraduate done in three years. Um, so I, so I, and I liked the small class sizes. Um, and so I, I loved everything about the campus. I, I, 
I don't know that I was as active as everything in everything as, as Tier was, but I um, one of the things I remember vividly about my freshman year, I had been a competitive swimmer since uh, third grade. Um, and so I signed up to be a swim team timer. At the time, there was only a men's swimming program at SMU. And over the course of my first year, some women got together and organized the first varsity women's swimming competition program there, asked me to join part of it. So I remember, asked me to join it. And so I, I swam for, for that first year. And then I decided swimming was kind of long hours in the swimming pool were interfering with taking full advantage of other aspects of college life, including the fun part of it. And so, but the first year we had some great memories. I remember we were brand new, we were scrappy. Uh, we, we drove ourselves to a swim meet down in South Texas somewhere. And we got stopped by a, the border patrol group of girls in this car. Um, so that was a lot of fun. I, I participated, I was in a sorority. It was a little sister for a fraternity. So I did a lot of you know, the different Greek activities on campus, um, a lot of the, the social things that they did, as well as some of the charitable projects. Um, I did some work in, in some student government. I remember I was the student representative on a search committee for the dean, I think of the art school. Um, and so I just tried to take full advantage of it, had wonderful, wonderful uh, roommates. And, uh, uh, you know, I remember great times in, in, in McIlvaney Hall. Um, if, as a freshman, uh, smelling that Mrs. Baird's bread from the factory that's no longer there. <laughs> so, and smelling that from the swimming pool sometimes too, as in the midst of our workouts. Uh, but it, it was a, I, I consider it a fantastic experience. I, I, I did apply to a couple of other colleges and, and was accepted at, at, at them, but I was, I'm so, so grateful that I chose SMU. Thank you all so much for sharing that. I know it's so fun hearing of similar organizations. I know we're still thriving on campus that you all were involved in as well as different aspects of life. So our next question I wanted to ask is, is there a professor or a class that jumps out to you that strongly impacted you while at SMU? I can answer that one easily. Uh, Dale Moffat, who was the head of the uh, acting program at SMU for a number of years. Um, he, I give him full, um, full credit uh, for, for where I am today and what I've been able to do uh, today. Um, he really taught me uh, what became my passion, which was uh, creating characters, um, which is, is a, a very specific type of acting. I don't know, that's kind of a lame thing to say, but uh, the idea of character and them changing uh, not just the way that they think, but their physicality and their voice. And um, I, I give him a tremendous amount of credit and, and will forever be grateful to SMU and to him for what he, uh, he gave me when I was there. Dale Moffat. Yeah, so, I can. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, oh. So for me, um, none of these individuals were my professors, uh, but I would call out uh, Professor Bruce Levy, who started the Inner Community Experience, the ICE program. Um, so that program really opened my eyes to how each of us, right, that the fact that we do have the means to help others, and we can use um, our education as well as the resources that we can obtain, you know, from, from various places in order to help other people in the community who are in need. And I'd also like to call out um, Arlene Manthe, who was the student activities um, advisor. And gosh, I don't know how many of us she knows. I'm sure thousands and thousands. And she's impacted all of our lives in terms of just the way that she interacted with the students. I felt lifted up all the time, every time that I interacted with Arlene. And now would call out um, Alec Park. Alec Park was the first Asian American student coordinator um, at SMU. And he was supported by Dr. James Caswell, who's no longer with us. Um, but they both were very um, supportive of the Asian students on campus and helped to fund the programming and the activities that we wanted to, um, to support and and make available on campus. And they gave us, they helped to give us a voice. And so all of all of those individuals have had a tremendous impact on my life. And uh, I learned what it was like to be a leader from them. I, 
I can't name just one either. I have to name a few. Um, three of them are from the English side of my degree in the Dedman College. And when I, I shared the story when I was honored as an as a, a outstanding alumni from Dedman that David Dillon, who taught Renaissance literature, and I took every class of his I could, Lawrence Perrine, who taught English poetry, and I took every class of his I could, and Joe Tyson, who taught um, New Testament and philosophy of religion. All those classes, um, I, what I shared at, at the Dedman College event was that I don't think there was one thing that was discussed at any, in any of those classes that ever came up at the White House or the State Department. But everything I learned in those classes taught me how to deal with everything I did at the White House and the State Department because they taught me to think, you know, to evaluate, to test logic, to deconstruct an argument, to, to understand, try to understand people's deepest beliefs and value systems. And so those classes really, really taught me just how to think. And, you know, when I, when I was at the White House, um, you cannot be an expert, neither can the president, of, on any of the subjects about which you have to make decisions, on every one of the subjects about which you have to make decisions. Um, so I remember the, the first couple of weeks, we had a meeting about the science of, of storing nuclear waste at Yucca Mountain. We had a meeting about Middle East peace. We had a meeting about tax cuts. We had a, a meeting about snowmobiling in national forests. And so, but you, and you can't possibly know what you need to know about any of those subjects. What you have to do is gather the experts listen to them, be able to evaluate, be able to think, be able to apply those lessons that I learned at Dedman College, earning my liberal arts degree at, at SMU. The other one I, I would call out was the um, head of the journalism department, uh, or, or at least, I think he was the chairman, maybe he was just a professor, but, but Bob Mann, who had been uh, Ted Kennedy's press secretary at one time, and was just very practical in his journalism teaching. So like the first day when when the bell rang, he locked the door to the classroom. He said, as a journalist, if you're late, you've missed the story. Um, he, the, the first week, he handed out an address on a slip of paper. And it was just an address. It didn't say what it was. And you had to go there and write a story about what you found there. And mine was kind of a lonely heart singles bar in deep East Dallas. And I'd never been any place like that in my life. And so it's just sort of, his class really opened up a world of, of kind of insights into things I'd never experienced before and, and uh, things that I'd, I'd never thought about before. And so um, that, that was, I think the, the learning to think and the, the new experiences and opening my eyes to uh, things that I hadn't previously thought about um, were, were lifelong lessons that I took from, from those professors. Yeah, and I can add to it, you know, this question as well as even the first topic is so great because it's allowing us to reflect on just how valuable the, the relationships are that you form at SMU. Um, they really do change, our, change your life. And so I definitely can attest to that, you know, in uh, some of the names that Thea mentioned, but, but Dr. Alice Kendrick uh, is still, you know, somebody who impacted me in the beginning uh, in advertising and, uh, and we're still close friends. She's a mentor today. She bugs me all the time to come talk to her class and it's fantastic, and I and I love it. I love every bit of it. And uh, you know, when I met Dr. Kendrick, it was uh, you know I, I had declared my major in advertising pretty early on. I think you know, like the start of my sophomore year, I just kind of chose it. But you know, you don't really know. You aren't sure. I wasn't sure. I knew I wanted to do something in communications, but when Dr. Kendrick found me, you know, it was uh, it, it just it, she gave me confidence, and it, it wasn't that I knew anything about advertising. She told me that you know, hey, you know how to write, you know, and uh, it, it was so fundamental. But she said, you know, writing, writing can take you a long way. And, uh, and she, you know, she kind of gave me, you know, that confidence. And, and then, you know, I, I, I proceeded to take many courses and, and tough classes and learn so much from her. You know, one in particular uh, in advertising that was still valuable, you know, as we took a trip, we took a trip to New York and, um, you know, we went and we visited, you know, the, the, uh, advertising agencies, top agencies all around the city. We had, you know, real experiences and, and did these things that really at the time felt surreal. I remember, I think, I, you know, I was like, I think the youngest in the class, there was a lot of upperclassmen and we did this thing. And, and uh, you know, not only did I, you know, have those amazing experiences, but we just formed a great relationship and, uh, you know, and it stuck with me, you know, uh, forever. And so I, I definitely, you know, um, it's, it's just been so valuable and I continue to, to bounce things off of her and, and talk and, and maintain that, you know, to this day.
Thank you so much. It was so fun hearing about that, especially since I recognize some of the names. Dr. Kendrick was my um, faculty in residence when I lived in Lloyd Commons, and Arlene has helped me beyond words to help with this lecture. She is truly one of a kind. I appreciate her support so much. So it's just so great to just hear that you guys were impacted by similar people who are still impacting us today. Well, so for my along, those, along those lines, sorry, I do want to say- No, you're I, good. I, no, that you know, my my understanding was, you know, a couple of our panelists didn't didn't name one name. That was what I thought the assignment was. So, I mean, I'm not going to point anyone out. Bad. <laughs> I'm not going to point anyone out, but I do want to give a special shout out because because I didn't say so many names. Uh, a faculty member who is still there, being uh, Bill Langfelder, uh, who uh, worked with me on movement when I was there, and you know him and Dale represent all the amazing faculty that were there uh, in the theater department when we were there. But I want to give a special shout out to Bill if he's, if he's listening and he knows that, that I remember and love him. Oh, and I SMU, love that. <laughs> SMU taught us that we can break the rules, Brian. Don't you remember that? <laughs> no, you better not start. You better not, if, if we can break the rules, this thing will go off the rails fast. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think our students and our audience would welcome that probably. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to move on to our next question. So often in college, it can feel like failing an exam or not getting into an organization or program is truly the end of the world. I know I have experienced this personally, and I'm sure many of our listeners have as well. When was one time that you failed at SMU and how did you overcome that failure? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a hard question. I, I, I don't, uh, maybe I'm an optimist, so I don't remember the bad things. I'm sure there were, there were bad things. Um, when, when you ask the question about failure, I think one of the things that, that I failed to do at SMU is, is sort of a failure of omission on my part. And I've felt it a lot since I left there and at different points throughout my career. I really wish I had taken more courses at the business school. I don't think I took any. And, and I, I, it was a real mistake. And I, I, throughout my life, I mean, now I serve on a public company board of directors. I've worked for the last 10 years with some of the world's biggest companies, Microsoft, Dow, um, Kimberly Clark, others like that. And I really wish that I had a good grounding in the fundamentals of business. And I, in fact, I, I serve on a board with Dr. Desai, who's, who's at the Cox School at the head of, of, of accounting there. Um, and I keep telling him, I'm, I'm still thinking I might maybe sign up and come take some courses or do one of those executive MBA programs because I have, it was a failure on my part. I didn't, I guess I didn't even think about it. And I, I really have regretted it over the course of my life. So my advice would be for all those liberal arts or fine arts or engineering or other students, um, you know, take some business courses because SMU has a really quality business program and I think it'll serve you well. Yeah, I, you know, to, to build on the way Karen answered that question, I would agree, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough question. It's a great question, you know, to reflect back on. I mean, I think for me, it was Spanish. You know, I, I had in, in my high school, I had taken a ton of Spanish, you know, and so much so that I had advanced credit, you know, and I, and I did start out at SMU taking some Spanish classes, but I had this extra credit. So I figured I, I don't need to keep going. I've got enough. I've got some extra. So it could kind of you know, I could kind of just wing it and move on to other stuff or, you know, get some free time I can maybe have. And so looking back on it, you know, I had so much. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I wish I had built on it at the time. I wish I had thought about, you know, extending that, maybe even have a, a, another major in that in foreign language or something. And so, you know, I think it's just, uh, again, looking back on it, you know, le leverage, leverage those opportunities, you know, it, it, you know, try things, do more, you know, take advantage of whatever you have, you know, a step forward in and go for it. You know, I think, um, Is it all of us or just him? <laughs> I think it's just him had a slight pause. But no <laughs> one was what moving. happens with virtual. Oh, here. I, I went back. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go next. Um, so I think it's a really good question, Piper. And um, I really have to think about this one. Um, so I think when I was a, a, a junior, there was a new student organization. There were some students who wanted to start up a new student organization. And I felt like um, it was going to divide, you know, divide us. Um, and 
I think my failure as I reflect back on this experience was that um, I was, I was not supportive of something that somebody else cared about. And the lesson that I learned as I reflect back on that experience is that it's not about being right all the time. And as a budding leader on campus, you know, it, I remember me being just going at it, you know, this is what we need to do, boom, 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 this is what's right and this is not right. Um, but I've come to realize that it's not right or wrong, it's just my opinion and my perspective and that um, I think I, I failed to be supportive of somebody else who wanted to do something that, that mattered to them. So one advice that I would offer to the audience here is as, as you're you know, learning to lead, um, you know, listen to what others care about as well uh, and not just what you want to do. And it's about working together as a team on the different things that you want to accomplish together. Uh yeah, I, you know, I, I think that for me, that the answer is is probably slightly different from from everyone else. I mean, you know, in Karen, for example, in, in her line of work, um, failure is not an option a lot of times, or the impact of those failures are are you know are seen around the globe. You know, for, for me, um, I realized in the arts, failure is is inevitable, um, and that it it's important. And what's, what's really important is about um, having the guts to take a risk and that you might be right, that you might be wrong, you might be partially right. There really is no right or wrong. You know, I mean, I'm saying all that as a joke, but, but truly uh, it's the try that's the most important. And, you know, I think in life too, to be willing to put yourself uh, out there and, and expose yourself in, in a way to, you know, uh, to different choices is is really valuable. So so for me th that came from there for sure. Um, the ability to play, to try, and to not be afraid to fail. I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but I think in in our work, you know, in, as, as an artist particularly, it's just really really important. Thank you so much for all of that great advice, as well as just, I think it's so meaningful to talk about times that we have failed. And as Brian said, failure is so important in order to grow and move on. So I just felt like that was very special to hear from all of you. So how have you guys seen the university change since you attended SMU? And Mark and Tier in particular, how, how has your perspective changed as parents of current SMU students? Well, I'll just say, because my answer is simple, they blew up my dorm. I mean, it's gone. <laughs> so how has it changed? I mean, where where my home was is literally not there. So I uh, my freshman dorm was Letterman dorm. It's a parking garage now. It's probably, <laughs> probably a way better use of space, let's be honest. Um, but that's how it changed. I, you know, I have been back. I, oh, uh, two things. I mean, one, for sure. Um, uh, uh, President Bush's library is a phenomenal crown jewel on the campus, mm -hmm. to be sure. Uh, but also, um, Moody Coliseum is awesome and so fun. And uh, if I lived in Dallas, I would probably live there. Uh, it's a <laughs> spectacular place uh, that the campus and the university should be tremendously proud of. And those are just a, a, a small few things. You know, again, I was supposed to be back in March. It's been now a few years, but those are, are, are beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in. You know, you know when I stepped foot on campus as a, as a senior in high school visiting SMU for the first time, it was gorgeous, right? And when I stepped foot on campus bringing my daughter to visit, who is now a sophomore, you know, it was even more gorgeous. And so... You know, there, there's certainly we all can attest to, you know, it's just beautiful, right? And, and, and the evolution of it has just continued. But I think more importantly, you know, and, and I'll segue into just, you know, as a parent now, um, kind of looking back and, and thinking about how I experienced it, it's just, you know, the, the, I really do appreciate how the school, um, you know, they, they provide so many caring services, they provide so much for the students, um, but they're also, I think, more, maybe more transparent than ever, you know? I mean, we definitely, 
are living in this world that is far from perfect, right? We've just had this, you know, we're, we're living in this, this, this historic time. Who knows how to even describe it now? And I think as a parent, I've really appreciated uh, the way that, that, that SMU has handled it in a way that is, is very admitted to not being perfect and things happen and embracing it, embracing, you know, the way to, to facilitate how students deal with it and handle it whether it's a protest, whether it's a march, you know, embracing it and welcoming it. Uh, you know, I think the president sent a note out earlier in the year when there were, there were some really tough topics going on around racism. And then he followed it with another note that said, hey, you know, I, I wanna rethink how I said that. I, I, have, I have certainly really, really appreciated that because, because it's, you know, we're, not, we're not perfect, we're human. So I think, you know, the facilities, the buildings, the grass is trimmed perfectly. I mean, it's just like, I've seen it all, but I, but more importantly, it's just, uh, I think the, the way that the organization handles things and they're true to form and they're transparent and supportive and attention to detail, you know, in every way. Uh, I, I, I really, I've seen it. I, maybe I didn't realize it happened back in the day, but now as a parent, I really see that. And, uh, and that's really cool to see. Well, I, I just wanna, I've worked for many years for, for a business leader and, he was chair of the Republican Party, Fred Meyer, and he always said that that Dr. Gerald Turner was one of the four people that he thought had made the biggest difference in, in changing the trajectory of Dallas and of the North Texas community. And I, I just have to say, he really, Dr. Turner's leadership in the last, what, 20 years that he's been there mm -hmm. has really transformed SMU um, I, and, and made it such a vital, vibrant part of the city of Dallas business community. Um, and, you know, his, I just, I've seen, I saw in working with some of the uh, team on the, on the Bush, um, the Bush Center and, and Bush Library that, you know, Dr. Turner's hand is, is, uh, and leadership is, is kind of in everything. And so they, they've been such careful stewards of the beauty of the campus, as you say, of, of modernizing the facilities, of, of just the thoughtful way that they integrated the, the Bush Center into the campus. Um, it's just, I'm, I could not be more proud. And it's, it's just, it's at a very, I think it, it's, I, I think I consider that I got a wonderful education there, but I think it's, it's so much of a higher level today as a, as a true, um, you know, really impactful uh, university. I agree wholeheartedly with Karen. I, I don't think I could have uh, said it better. And, you know, I remember in 1996, I was one of the student representatives that, who was on the selection committee. To uh, to find Dr. Turner, so it's Good been for you. <laughs> Congratulations! Thank you to see how he has really made an impact on campus. Um, I've observed um, a, a couple of things. One, the increase in focus on leadership on campus, um, particularly in the engineering school. Now, I remember I I was there in the you know in the mid '90s, early '90s, mid '90s in the engineering school, and I think that the Lyle School of Engineering has has just thrived over the years, and the increased focus on leadership in engineering I think is is phenomenal. Um, the second thing that I'll mention is is just the um, the the connection and the collaboration with the business community. Uh, you know, in, in the Dallas area. I mean, SMU is involved in everything. In fact, um, I'm co-chairing the 2020 Women on Boards event that's coming up in November, and SMU is a, a sponsor and, and engaged with us um, every step of the way. Um, and then thirdly, I'll mention just the increased diversity in so many ways, physically, as well as in the student body, uh, in the faculty. So the focus on diversity and inclusiveness, I have seen um, have accelerated uh, over the years since I've since I've been there. So very proud uh, to be a part of, of the university and part of this uh, community because of all of those things. And the fact that our motto is "World Changes Shaped Here" that's just amazing. That's just incredibly inspiring, you know, for us to, to come come here, study here, make the connections and the network, and then be prepared and enabled to go off and change the world for the better. Thank you guys so much for that. I absolutely loved all of your answers. That was so inspiring. I'm going to go ahead and actually ask a question that came in on our Q&A chat. So Adelaide was wondering, what was your favorite SMU tradition? Golly, good question. <laughs> SMU tradition. 
Well, I was there back in the old days when SMU played football in the Cotton Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> and this may not be popular because now I know the students probably love playing on campus, but I loved going to the Cotton Bowl back in Eric Dickerson's heyday and, and watching football games there. So I think that was probably my favorite. I mean, pony up and, you know, I think that, you yeah. know, the song varsity, I mean, we get, we, I think, you know, again, my wife is also an Sing alum. it, Mark. We Sing still, it, Mark. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Maybe at the end. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, I mean, by the way, I, I mean, again, being back fairly recently and the, um, the boulevard, right? The boulevard now before the games and stuff is so fun, is so great. Um, we didn't have that, at least for three of the panelists here, because I know that we were there generally at the same time. Like that, that didn't exist. And we were all three sort of coming off. Uh, I'm speaking for them now, by the way. They told me I could. Um, coming off of the death penalty when football didn't happen. Um, there had been a few years. Um, this is not really what you're asking, but but I remember the pony up and the song, uh, the hail to the red and the blue. And, uh, and, and we beat Arkansas at home while i was there and i remember that was that's a big deal that was a very very big deal i remember that and and also um while i was there i'm trying to think if mark and tier would have been there too I, I don't remember what year it was but um on our basketball uh resurgence here the last few years when we were there that was the last time they'd been to the ncaa tournament they had a very very good team um, that's right. When we were there, right. and that was that was also fun, uh, which makes it even yeah even more fun now to go back and see what Moody happened. But yeah, I guess that that would be it. We didn't have the Boulevard though. If if we had the Boulevard, I, my answer would be the Boulevard. I'm not sure that I have a a different answer, Piper. <laughs> That is completely okay. So I'm gonna ask another question. So Sammy was wondering, he'd love to know what specifically you learned from SMU that you think has helped set you up for success in your respective fields. Um, I learned how to ask for money. So with the different student organizations that I was involved in, you know, we, we needed to find funding for, uh, for things that we wanted to do. And when, when the budget didn't provide for the extra things that we wanted to do, I remember writing letters, you know, to uh, Dr. Caswell for the most part, <laughs> you know, um, asking for money to, to, to be able to do the things that, that, um, that we wanted to do. So I think just it's, it's the asking part having the courage to ask for what you need and ask for what you want. Um, in my career now as, as a consultant in the professional services area and also in, in my progression in my own personal career, it's, you know, don't be afraid to ask for what you need and for what you want. I learned how to be an actor. I mean, I kind of spoke to that before, but that, yeah. I mean, I truly learned that there. And um, it wasn't about the business of being an actor. It wasn't like how to audition or tricks to do this or that. It, it was really about um, the mechanics of, of creating character, as I said before. So yeah, for me, that that was it. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's again, another really great question I was thinking about. I mean, I think probably, you know, being an, an athlete there, I, it's just a sense of balance, right? Like it just a, just trying to have it. I, I was not a scholarship athlete. I walked on to the track team and 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 made the track team and competed in you know Division One track, you know, at, at, in the old Southwest Conference. And I think you know once, you know, once I was on the team, there were those moments when I did, you know, I was like, okay, I don't, what am I doing here? I got too much to do. And but I learned, you know, to, that I was a part of something and that it actually really helped me. It helped give me a sense of balance, you know, um, to, to just be, you know, a part of a team from a competitive standpoint, you know, and to, and to do, you know, balance that with all the academics and the rigor. And, uh, you know, probably, you know, fell into the trap of taking those things for granted of what it did give me. And so I think, you know, now later in life, it's, uh, you know, wow, just, you know, the ability to be active and do something and do those things. You know, I definitely, 
hold that strong, you know, to this day. And I, I look back on, so thankful to have had those experiences, you know, it teaches you how to, how to fight and be competitive and all those things that sports give you. But more than anything, it's just the, the overall sense of uh, balance and structure that it gave me day to day. I think to, for me, it was to, to push boundaries a little bit, like Tier said, to try new things, to be a little less fearful or more, or more fearless about things, both in, both in forming the first women's um, swim team. And uh, uh, I mentioned the going to the, the bar that I'd never been to a place like that before, but also my, my final year at SMU, my, my senior year, um, I took a course called Radio TV News Writing from a man named Lee Alcessor, who was the news director at Channel 5 at the time. And at the time, SMU, maybe in the business school, but not in the fine arts school or the journalism school, didn't really have an internship program. And I remember I wanted more than anything, I, I fell in love with this art of marrying words and pictures in a way that communicated more eloquently than either did alone. And so I wanted to go work at a, at a television station. And so I convinced them to set up an internship for me, to let me go work at Channel 5. Where my, basically, I spent every waking hour of my senior spring semester at the TV station. Um, they eventually started letting me do some news stories. And when I graduated, they offered me a job. So, and, and you know, that program really wasn't even in place um, when, when I took that class. So I, I think I would echo what, what Tier said is I learned to ask and, and to pursue things and to push boundaries um, and, and to be fearless in, in doing that. Perfect. Okay, so this next question is actually directed towards Karen, but Tier, you can actually also answer now that I'm thinking about it. So Karen, Dallas Morning News once described you as the most powerful woman ever to serve in the White House. What advice can you give young women such as myself who are planning to enter a male dominated career field? That's a good question. Um, I think, you know, be confident in what, in what you bring to the table. Um, I think one of the reasons that President Bush valued my advice was, was that he knew that I was um, an advocate for him. So I had his interests at heart but he also knew that I would always tell him what I really thought. And when I left the White House, I actually gave um, my colleagues a piece of unvarnished wood because I was known for giving President Bush my unvarnished opinion. Now that didn't mean I didn't do it in a polite or respectful way, but if I thought he was doing something that was wrong, I was relentless in, in telling him that. Or likewise, if I thought he needed to do something that he wasn't doing, I was pretty relentless in telling him that as well. And I think one of the things I, I learned from President Bush is he, he could evaluate people based on the confidence of their convictions. Um, I, once, I heard him probably almost every time somebody new came in to brief him, if they were just going through their you know, briefing book, at some point in the presentation, he would stop, tell them stop, and he'd say, I want to hear what you really think. <laughs> and so he, he, you know, he really liked that, that confidence of your, of your convictions. Um, my mother, I'll, I'll tell, I'll share a funny story. My mother came to, and father came to the White House. Um, President Bush very nicely invited them into the Oval Office. And, you know, it's kind of intimidating to walk in there and, and realize it's the room you see so much on TV. And that's not a cardboard cutout. That really is the president. And my mom later said to me, she said, Karen, she said, don't, don't you, don't you get nervous when you have to go in there and, and tell him something that, that he might not want to hear? And I was able to honestly answer no. And part of the reason was, I think that I have strong convictions, but part of the reason was he also encouraged that and valued that. And as a leader, he wanted and valued his, his, his team's honest opinions. And so that's another leadership lesson that I would encourage all for all of you. Make sure the people who work for you know you want to hear what they really think. Um, because if you don't agree with them sometimes, you may send them the signal that they should be quiet. And President Bush went out of his way not to send that signal. So after graduation, I went into uh, the consulting profession in the technology uh, area, which is male dominated. And I went in um, not believing in myself and I went in thinking that I didn't belong. So my first advice would be, um, to believe more in yourself and, and have the confidence that you do belong. Uh, and, you know, 
I've had many mentors and sponsors who've helped me in my career. And I often say that they believe in me more than I believe in myself. So if I could give advice to my younger self, I would say believe more in yourself um, is one. And, and don't worry about believing in yourself too much because I don't think that's possible. <laughs> um, secondly, I would say um, support other women, lift each other up, amplify each other's voices, particularly if you're women who are in a, um, in, in a field that where you're, uh, where you're the minority, right? Because we, we need to be looking out for each other and help each other, right? Because we're all kind of going through similar things. Um, and so I would say women supporting women is critically important. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that as just a young woman myself, as I said, planning to enter a male dominant field. So Brian, this next question's for you because I think we have a lot of office junkies currently <laughs> watching based on all the questions I'm getting. That's so you obviously really played- weird. the surprising. I wouldn't have expected that. I know, who's ever heard of The Office before? I haven't, but <laughs> you yeah. obviously played the iconic character of Kevin from The Office. What was the most challenging part of playing this character and what was your favorite part? Um, um, the most, well, look, I, it, to be in the field that I am, to have the ability or, 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 or to be working period is amazing. Um, so the fact that, that I was working was amazing. The fact that I got to work uh, on the same job for 10 years makes it like beyond amazing. Um, but to be able to work on a job on a show that I was tremendously proud of uh, and a fan of myself made it unbelievable. Um, I felt from a very, very um, early on in the process that the show was doing something um, that that shows just weren't doing at the time and not just in the obvious ways that people know that lack of a laugh track or um, you know a documentary style and all that but you know television for about 20 years um, it, it had gotten very nice and the way that the show examined um, gender inequality sexuality race um, to name just a few um, I was tremendously proud of, and it really started on our second episode and, and went all the way through. So, um, you know, we have a lot of fans now, the fans are younger and younger. Um, we are seven years since we have filmed a shot, uh, today it's the most watched show, uh, in the world. And the popularity of the show has only increased in the seven years since we've been off, which is just a, an amazing uh, thing and, and something that I'm, I'm very grateful for. Um, do I make a joke? The most difficult part was the chili. The, the fan, chili? The fans will get it. Yes. <laughs> There's a, an iconic scene. You can look after this, look it up. Just look up Kevin from the office, or chili don't. scene. It will, it will pop up or don't. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this next question is for Mark. And so Mark, you currently serve as an SVP of marketing at Beyond Meat Inc. And if I'm correct, you took this role on due to the opportunity to make a lasting impact on human health, climate change, global resource sustainability and animal welfare. How do you best believe that SME students can make a global impact right now? And if anyone else has any thoughts, you can also answer this question. Oh, wow. That's a great one. Uh, yeah, well, I think, you know, um, being a part of Beyond Meat is, a, is um, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, opportunity and challenge, you know, because, because what we do is, you know, we, we produce something that is really changing a behavior that goes back to like the beginning of time, right, and how we eat. And so, um, you know, getting people to understand, you know, uh, the benefits of a plant-based diet, um, but in a way that is inspiring in a way that kind of meets you where you are 
um, you know, doesn't really force it, you know, um, uh, is, is a really, it's a really, you know, fun challenge and exciting opportunity that I have as, a, as I work there in marketing. And so the way that everybody can make an impact is actually by, by just trying it, right? And not, and, you know, it's like, you know, you don't have to um, go cold turkey, you know, try some things and actually start to, you know, meet, uh, let the, let plant-based diet meet you where you are. And so, you know, um, once a week, twice a week, you know, doing those things, you know, um, really makes a difference. And, and I think, you know, um, that's what we try to do, you know, as a, as a brand and as a company is, is inspire people that, hey, this is something that actually embraces, um, you know, meatballs, burgers, all of these things that you normally do. And so, you know, that's an opportunity. And I think, you know, what people don't realize is that, you know, what we consume and what we eat, um, what we cook uh, really does make an impact actually on the environment, you know, probably more than anything. And uh, we're trying to make sure that message gets out there. So just, it's on you. Give it a shot. <laughs> so this question is directed towards Tier, but anyone can actually answer it as well. But Tier, I wanted to start off by just saying that based on all of your many accomplishments, your clear passion for helping others by striving to build up their leadership and philanthropic capacity, you clearly are the definition of a servient leader. And so I wanted to ask, what is your advice to current college students about finding meaningful ways to help out and give back to others in their chosen career field? And you can all touch on this as you all have found different meaningful ways to give back and kind of get involved within your various careers. Hmm. You know, one of the things that SMU has taught me was to be an engaged student and to be an engaged leader. And that means to care about something. And a favorite question of mine, whenever I meet new people is, what matters to you? What do you care about? So I think for each, um, each of the students here, you know, as you, you, you think about that, you may not know what you wanna do you know, in, in your life, not quite yet, you're not 100% sure, and that's okay. But just think about like right now, what do you care about? What causes are important to you? What are the things that, that tug at your heart? And whatever those things are, just realize that you have a voice and your voice matters on those things. And don't be afraid to share you know, your perspective and your voice um, on those subject matters. And then find ways to, um, to help. And again, yeah, I loved what Mark said. It doesn't have to be anything grandiose. You know, it's, it's just when you care about something, um, something that matters to you, you will find a way to either you know, go volunteer or to collaborate with another student or work with a professor or you know, um, be part of a nonprofit. There are so many ways that you can contribute. And once you do that and, and you give of your time and give of your resources, you're really buying happiness you know, when you do that. And I have a favorite quote that I'd like to share by uh, Winston Churchill. And that quote is, you make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. And so when you're, when you're giving to others, you're giving to your, yourself in terms, of, in terms of your fulfillment and meaning and happiness. I want to pick up on something Tier said. One of my favorite quotes was Mother Teresa said, do small things with great love. One of the challenges I think you face when you come out of a big job, like working in Washington or being at the State Department, traveling the world, you come home and you think, how do I make a difference? Um, what do I, what do I do? What's next? And I, I gradually, I think, realized over the course of that experience that it didn't have to do a big thing. I went back to teaching Sunday school for kindergartners. I love to teach Sunday school. I love little kids. Um, I helped a neighbor taking her to visit her husband in a nursing home. I tried to cook meals and share. I love to cook and entertain. So I tried to cook meals for neighbors that I, were going through challenges um, so I, so I want to echo what Tier and, and Mark said about it doesn't have to be, um, I do meatless Mondays sometimes, Mark, so I made a start. Um, so yeah, so do, um, you know, so, so don't feel like it always has to be something huge. That's great. Piper, I have to tell a story real quick about my third grade teacher. So I started yes, school. I was, yes, go ahead. Yeah, so I started school in the third grade, and when I met him he was in his 20s and I was eight years old and um he was a third grade teacher in elementary school and when there was an influx of 
um, refugee children from Cambodia and from Laos. This is in the early 80s. The Dallas Independent School District didn't know what to do with us kids. And so they had a teacher's meeting. And my third grade teacher, at the time he wasn't my teacher, but he raised, up, he, he raised his hand and he said, I'll take them. I'll, I'll teach them. We didn't know English, okay? And you know, he still teaches elementary school today. You know, you won't, you won't see his name in any famous books. He's not in, you know, social media. He's, you know, not being um, spotlighted or anything like that. But he's had a tremendous impact on my life. And I hope that I, because of what I've learned from him, that I've been able to give back to others and I've had impact on other people's lives who will replicate that to others. And so I just want to just reiterate the importance of if you care about something, you know, the, the small steps that you take to help somebody else, that will make a huge impact. That's great. Great. Thanks for sharing that story. That's a great story. I actually remember Tara covering that as a reporter, covering not, not the specific teacher, but covering the school district there was a big influx and, and the school district wasn't sure because there were so many different languages and and uh, it was it was a, a real challenge i remember as a reporter covering that story so amazing you know I, such in, a small world <laughs> yeah. somewhat related to this you know i just, you know one of the things i became to appreciate at smu was just you know you're there in the bubble of the campus right let's face it it's a bubble it feels that way sometimes and it's a beautiful one but also just you know, being in Dallas in the community and so doing things, you know, all around and, and, and having those chances to, to get out and do things around the community. I mean, I remember, you know, different organizations that I was, I was in, you know, we would do things with kids in the community. Sometimes we brought kids to campus. And so, you know, as a student, you're just, you know, you're hitting the books, you have those tough days and you're just you're worried about yourself, yourself. But when you have those moments that pick up on the culture around and the communities and, and kids, then you give back, you start to realize as a student how valuable that is just to, to, to people outside. And I, I, you know, I think I had a somewhat of an understanding of that, but at SMU, I really started to realize, you know, the, the impact and, and what it meant to give back in that sense. And so I appreciated that, you know, it kind of goes back to even your earlier question, what did I love about SMU? And, and it was, you know, it's being in the bubble, but as much as everything outside of it, um, that, uh, you know, really, really makes a difference. I know we've touched on a bit of this today, but I just wanted to ask, how did your time at SMU shape you into the person you are today? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> <Everybody's laughing. laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in every way, you know, I think, uh, you know, a lot of those things that we touched on, um, you know, for, well, for one thing, you know, I, I met my wife there. So, you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a pretty important element that came into play. But I think overall, I mean, I think I think it's many of the things it's it's, you know, it's the experiences that we had, you know, I mean, the, the internship I had, you know, in my between my uh, junior and senior year, I actually interned at the Dallas Morning News. And so it's it's going through that having those experiences outside in the professional world as you're a student. It's uh, it's the communities, you know, that 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 I was a part of, you know, it's the the leadership that I gained from, you know, professors like Dr. Kendrick. Um, it is, you know, the hospitality, the good Southern hospitality that you had in the cafeteria when you go to eat and how, you know, I felt like, you know, every time I gave him my card that I was I was giving it to like my aunt or something, you know, it felt like family. And so there was always like a respect and things. And so all of those attributes, you know, I think over time, you know, stuck with me and, uh, and, they, and they've, they've kind of shaped, you know, who I am today, you know, and, and kind of in, in, in many ways. The little things as well as the big things. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I feel like I talked about that quite a bit. I mean, I, I guess the only thing that I didn't say was very specifically, uh, there were three other graduates from SMU that um, we started a theater company together, you know, immediately after school and um, moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota and started working right away uh, because, you know, we had figured out that that was a place we could go and actually make theater and, and possibly get funding. Um, we learned, like Tier said, how to, how to ask for money. Um, 
and uh, yeah, and I, and I did that with them because I, I believed that SME was creating special artists and, and found special artists uh, that were there during that time, not just in my class, but in the years surrounding it. So that literally launched my career, uh, moving from a student and with the same people um, into a, you know, forming a professional theater company that, um, uh, that started my journey. So, yeah. So other, than things, other than things I've already mentioned, um, I, I think that, you know, the, my journalism classes really taught me a lot about asking questions and, and obviously led to helping me get a, a job immediately on graduation. And I spent seven years as a television reporter. And I often told people as a television reporter, I had to walk into rooms like Dallas school board meetings where I often knew very little about what people were talking about. And I had to listen and figure out what was important and what was not. And then I had to figure out how to communicate it. And that training was absolutely invaluable um, to, to, my, um, to what I did during my public service career in the Texas governor's office, later in the White House and the State Department, because I found myself in rooms where I often knew very little about what was being discussed. And I had to figure out quickly, I had to listen carefully, analyze, figure out what was important, what was not, and then help President Bush decide and communicate that decision. So, and it, that all started um, at SMU. So Piper, for me, um, when I came to SMU, I felt like an outsider. I was a commuter, number one, I was Asian American. I wasn't Greek, you know, I, I, I didn't rush, didn't know how, you know. So in many ways, I felt like, like an outsider. I think what has shaped me to be who I am today in terms of my experience at SMU was that I was seen, even though, you know, in many ways I was an outsider, I was seen. I was seen by Arlene, I was seen by Dr. Caswell, I was seen, you know, by all the people that I mentioned. And they gave me the opportunity, you know, to, you know, to experience experience and experiment and try new things and lead. And I was always supported, you know, with the ideas that I had. And so being seen and being valued and being heard has shaped me into, I think, the leader that I am today, where I seek to provide forums for people to have their voices be heard. Thank you so much. That was so great to hear about that. Um, we're going to do another student question. So Elm asked, how did each of you utilize the city of Dallas while you were an SMU student? So Dallas was my home. So, uh, so I, I was already here. But for me, it was the ICE program, the Inner Community Experience Program, and um, being involved in the city through you know, the, the work there, uh, working with, with the kids. Um, yeah, so that, that, was, uh, that was the extent in terms of how I used to see, I guess I lived here and then was able to, uh, to give back as well. Well, at the time uh, there uh, was of course the Dallas Theater Center uh, that was in town. And uh, one of which I know was founded by some um, some students from the theater school in Dallas shortly before I got there. There was a kitchen dog theater and there were a couple of more. Uh, the theater scene in Dallas was beginning to increase. And so, you know, we were offered opportunities to do real world uh, learning in terms of both production on stage and also uh, backstage and getting a sense for, for how that happened. And, you know, so much so that we were uh, you know, prepared when, you know, when I graduated to, to go and start a theater company of our own. So that was it for me. Um, that, and I think there's a, uh, my name is on some, some bar stools fairly close to campus, um, that maybe I went to a time or two, um, uh, while I was, I was at school, but, um, um, I enjoyed the city that way as well. But, uh, yeah, I would say the, the theater, the, the local theater scene that, that really expanded around the time that I was there. Yeah, and I, you know, for me, again, it's another great question. I'd say I, I use Dallas 
per- professionally and socially. You know, I think professionally, as I mentioned, that summer of my junior year, I had an internship at the Dallas Morning News. Um, looking back on it, it's kind of funny, newspaper advertising, and I ended up doing many different types of things. But that gave me some great, you know, professional experience, you know, that, that summer, you know, it was a real job. And, uh, and, and it certainly helped as I went on, you know, and graduated <laughs> and worked in that field. But socially also just, you know, the African-American community all around Dallas became a part of my experience, right? And so, what, you know, it was, um, you know, we certainly had a bond there on the campus, but it extended to the many other universities and colleges around, whether it was UT Arlington, Paul Quinn, North Texas, you know, my frat brothers from those schools, can, we connected together, whether it was uh, the Association of Black Students at those schools, we did things together socially and we had, and so that community became, again, something that was just so, so huge for me. Um, I was from out of state and, uh, and, and, you know, again, it was like the blending of all those experiences, but that, that specifically was something that, you know, I really appreciated during the entire time. Well, I already mentioned my, my internship obviously was critical at, at KXAS TV. Um, I remember participating in a number of community service projects. I don't remember the names of them or what exactly they were, um, but, I, but I know um, both at, on, as a member of the student body, but also through my, my sorority and my little sister as a, as a fraternity. Um, and I, I guess one of the most memorable things for me was the the journalism school particularly brought in a lot of leaders from the Dallas journalistic community. So I remember they, they brought in somebody who was working at the Dallas Morning News as a magazine writer. They brought in, um, uh, you know, a head of the Texas Trial Lawyers Association to speak to us. They, they, they tapped a lot of people and brought them in to us, to the school that we were able to learn from, particularly in, in, in journalism. Yeah, and I'll follow up. It doesn't really answer your question, Piper, but to what Karen is saying, that was a really big deal. This is not so much for me about Dallas, but um, you know, when I was there, it was shortly after Kathy Bates had won the Oscar for Misery, and she came back to campus. Um, Bob Hope came to campus while while he was still alive, um, and you know that SMU did that outreach. I mean, Kathy had, had gone to SMU. Um, that was, uh, that, that, that's something that really, really stuck with me. So it wasn't necessarily a Dallas connection, but um, you know, I, I, I'll, tell, I'll tell a quick story. So Kathy Bates and I en- ended up working together and I came in one morning very early uh, to the makeup chair. And I said, I said, Kathy, you know, I want you to know um, we'd known each other a little bit at that point. I said, you know, I was a student at SMU. I've been a little kind of weird saying this to you. And I, I brought her in a book and it was a book. Uh, she came when they opened up uh, uh, the uh, Greer Garson Theater, which was a Shakespeare thrust stage on SMU's campus. And she came and there was a, a book I, I showed her and it was a, a, a book of Shakespearean love sonnets. And I said, I, I want you to see this book. So before I knew that you could do this with someone, when you came to campus after you left campus and my mom knew what a big deal this was for me, she sent you this book and you signed it for me. Uh, and, and she wrote a very nice inscription to me. I'm sure she had no idea who I was. And that, that, that she did that, that my mom thought to do that, that there was that like connection that happened, that we had been on stage together with an Oscar winner when, you know, I was a, sophomore or whatever in school like that was a big deal and you know so so for me and I'm I know for everyone else who's here you know it it makes me want to well participate tonight but also to go back and whether anyone thinks I have anything valuable to say or not I don't know I at least want to try because of because of the experience that I had when I was there. So Piper I had a a famous um, celebrity story too so when I was one of the co-chairs with Watana Tucker um, with the Women's Symposium. Our keynote speaker that year was uh, First Lady Hillary Clinton. And so when she came, I gave her a cherry Coke because that was her favorite. I heard somewhere that that was her favorite drink. So that was cool. We also had Christy Yamaguchi who came uh, to speak. So yeah, to to the points that that Brian and Karen have made, um, just the, 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 
the people who are making an impact in the world um, that we brought them to campus, you know, and, and gave students the connections with them. And I know now with the Tate lecture series, right, and students having the opportunity to participate and hear from um, thinkers from around the world, it's, it's just amazing. Okay, I'm going to transition to our final question. What is your advice to current SMU students that you wish you had known when you were in college? So I'll start that one because I've given it a lot of thought. Um, I would say don't be in such a rush as I was. <laughs> I mean, I, I really, looking back, I didn't, I should have spent four years and taken business classes and, and taken more advantage of, of the opportunities on campus. Um, and, and so I, I, I remember early in my career, I was always in a rush. I, you know, the first, after, after two years in television journalism, I remember telling Bob Mann, who had taught me at SMU, that I thought I'd learned everything I needed to learn from television. So I was in a rush to move on. And he looked at me and he said, you haven't even begun to scratch the surface. And he was exactly right. And so I would just, I, I would just say, don't be in such a rush. Um, I, during my time at the White House, as I would walk through the Rose Garden, I would literally say to myself, stop and smell the Rose Garden, <laughs> stop and smell the roses, and you know, savor this a little bit, take it in, don't be in such a rush. And so I, I think that's what I would tell my younger self and advise all of you. Yeah, I, I tell people, I, it's quite frankly, very similar to what Karen has talked about a number of times today too. And it's what, when I'm talking to young actors, I, I think it applies across, um, across any discipline. But yeah, like Karen said, I wish I'd taken business classes. Like do that stuff. That university there has so many possibilities of things you can explore. And truly like, what's the worst that happens? You don't like it. You don't like this activity or this course or this game or, you know, but just go, you know, and that that's particularly what I tell people, you know, who would be in, in Meadows, right? It's like, don't, don't, don't dismiss the football stadium. It's on campus, you know, it, go out and walk the boulevard and go over and experience that. And if you don't like it, well, then you don't have to do it again or whatever but take advantage of those opportunities and the different schools that exist there if you don't take classes in meadows do you know engineering business dead men all of that i guess everyone's a dead man but you know what i'm saying um I, so that's that would my my biggest piece of advice yeah i i mean i agree, I agree. you know i think what we all have this is just definitely a similar theme you know when, when you look back on it it's like it's you know life teaches you it's like it's all set up to just get, be in order and follow the script and get ready for this and on to the next thing and get the job and it just you know explore force you know commit yourself to ex exploration you know and it's easier said than done because we all were there and, and and we did it and got a guy you know graduating and getting a job all these but just take advantage of, of that time. And, and, you know, I think that's, again, one of the things I've, I've definitely appreciated and as a parent seeing how SMU grows and there's, there's more opportunities, you know, there's a human rights program, there's education, but like there's all these things that, you know, perhaps weren't there and they've evolved and done more. And so, you know, just, just give yourself, just think about it, pick your head up and look around and explore and, and try some things as you're there um, and be, you know, force yourself to be in, in that moment and be in, in the present and um, and leverage it, you know, because there's there's a lot, lot of tools there to do that. I couldn't agree more and couldn't stress it more. You know, what Karen said about business classes and what Mark said about exploring, what Brian said about trying and, and experimenting different things. And I would add to that to say, um, step outside of your comfort zone. It's really hard to do, but just do it. And one thing that I wish I had done when I was in college was to step out of my comfort zone and um, do, do a study abroad. So I didn't do study abroad and I have friends who have done that and I wish I had done that because I know that that would open my eyes so much more to other possibilities. Do you know what I wish? I've never said this to anyone before, Tier, but you just said that. And after I finished, I said, I wish I had said this. I'll tell you right now, my biggest regret is I didn't take Spanish classes. There you go. Take Spanish class. I, for real. I'm not, but I'm really not joking. I wish that someone had said, 
you have to take Spanish, Spanish or some foreign language. You go to Europe and people speak three and four languages. It's not, it's not a source of national pride to only speak English. Just if that's my biggest piece of advice to you tonight. It is not a point of personal pride to only speak one language. There you go. That's what I've got. Concluding with that wonderful advice, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. And thank you so, so much to Mark, Tier, Brian, and Karen for sharing with us their SMU experience and such amazing wisdom. I want everyone to please check out the SMU Student Foundation website for more event information for the rest of the week. And please tune in to the homecoming football game on Saturday to watch our undefeated SMU Mustangs take on the Bearcats. Thank you all and good night. Hyper, thanks for all your work on this. Pony up. Yes, of yeah. course. Pony up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.